talk about The Walking Dead and a new attraction here at Universal Studios Hollywood. Um, I'm going to get into introductions in a second uh, to let you know who we got here on stage with me. Um, but first, um, how many of you guys were able to see the, uh, the announcement live on Talking Dead recently? How many? Yeah? Okay, for those of you who didn't see it, really quick video to set it up. Um, this was played live on uh, Talking Dead just a couple weeks ago, so here you go. I am also serving as tech today, so let's hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> so when I push play and nothing happens. Control on delete. Reboot windows. Green Yeah, exactly. It's the spinning wheel for Comic Con Day. Yeah. Yes. Assistance from the audience? <laughs> we also brought sock puppets. <laughs> I'm just a creative director. I have no idea what I'm doing technically. <laughs> Oh, oh my god. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> we'll get a, we'll get a description. I can do fully to this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've actually done that professionally in my career a few times. Um, so let's get into introductions of who we got here today. Um, on stage with me, I'd like to introduce. Uh, Two of my partners who's working with me on this attraction. Um, Mr. Don Burgess, who is the producer. Thank you. Thank you. And my longtime partner, Mr. Chris Williams, who's our art director and production designer. Um, I'm going to start with Don, just if you wouldn't mind, you know, introduce yourself, Don. Tell the folks who you are and, and your association with Universal here. Uh, Don Burgess here. I've been with Universal on and off for over 20 years um, as a consultant and producer working on Halloween Horror Nights and attractions and shows. Um, and uh, also been at Disney Imagineering and uh, have basically worked on Halloween at Six Flags, Universal, Knott's Berry Farm, Queen Mary. Um, been a whore everywhere. So, uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's good to be partnered with these two gentlemen, and um, it's a real honor to uh, work on a great product like this with two of the best in the industry. But um, uh, before I, I pass it over to them, I also want to acknowledge uh, we have four of our key people here today that are working on the attraction with us. I'd like them to stand up and, and give you, have you give them a round of applause too. We have Colleen, we have Danny, we have Joseph, and we have Pat. We, we are working with us on this attraction and are doing the day-to-day -day heavy lifting of making sure we get to our summer opening. So um, we have a great deal of gratitude to them and how they support us daily. All right, Mr. Chris Williams. Chris, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to everybody. Hey, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. You guys probably see me around in regarding Halloween Horror Nights. Um, I've been at Universal for 17 years and uh, was brought in uh, actually with an outside company to work on uh, Halloween. And right from that get-go, I was pulled on the inside and had uh, actually uh, got a job as uh, entertainment designer essentially and art director for the entertainment department um, and through those years we've done Halloween and 
Um, we rebooted it, you guys know, since 2006. And, uh, and we're working with John on, on IPs and the conceptual of what we do in the mazes as well as layout and art direction. And, you know, we try to put you guys right into the uh, middle of a horror movie or right in uh, the middle of this crazy horror experience. So, um, and we try to do that and, and you guys will see um, what we're trying to do, you know, with this attraction. So, really excited to bring it to you. Been doing horror for a long time, for almost about 25 years, with other theme parks and such as well. Um, so, thanks for coming. Totally excited about it. Okay. And uh, I'm John Murdy. I'm the uh, creative director on this project. I'm also um, a longtime creative director, producer on Halloween Horror Nights. How many of you guys have been to Horror Nights? I'm assuming. <laughs> My introduction to horror came when I was four years old, um, when my mother made the mistake of uh, showing me Frankenstein. Was, uh, back in the 1970s, um, probably a lot of you weren't even born in the 1970s, but back in the 1970s there was a, kind of an era where uh, horror movies were shown on television a whole lot, and uh, my mom thought it would be a good idea to let her four-year-old son watch Frankenstein. And uh, from that moment I was hooked, so I became obsessed with the Universal Classic Monsters, and I started coming to Universal as a, as a guest in 1972. Um, so when I got out of college, uh, I started at Universal in 1989 as a tour guide on the Universal Studios tour. Um, and uh, pretty much been with Universal my entire career. I actually met Chris uh, in 2001 when I was doing an old show for the theme park called Special Effects Stages, which was down in the lower lot. It used to have a part of the attraction called the Creature Factory. Um, which was all, you know, horror-based about our classic uh, monster characters, and, and Chris was my art director on that project. Um, and then after that, uh, I spent most of my career with Universal Creative, uh, and I was, uh, I had just finished up the Revenge of the Mummy ride, um, and I had gotten a call um, from the, at that time, the general manager of the theme park asking me if I would have any interest in bringing back uh, Halloween Horror Nights to Universal Studios Hollywood, because if you know your history, and actually Dawn, I think, and, and Chris predate me on this, they both worked on earlier iterations of Halloween Horror Nights back in the 90s for you, Chris, right? And Don, you were in the 90s as well. Um, so in 2006, I took the leap and decided to try to bring Horror Nights back working with Chris. And uh, thanks to all of you guys who have supported the event down through the years. Um, you know, every year it's been more successful than the last. And if you've come to Halloween Horror Nights, you know, uh, the last four years, you'll know that we have heavily featured The Walking Dead. Um, so today, what we're going to do is talk about a brand new attraction that is a permanent attraction. And I should make, you know, that, that distinction here, because if you've been to Horror Nights, you know what we do for Horror Nights. We create these very highly elaborately detailed mazes, but no matter how detailed they are, um, they're still temporary. You know, we, we, we set them up. Uh, we, usually they're in a tent, uh, we tear them down as soon as the event's over. This is very, very, very different and very exciting. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're creating a, a permanent attraction that's going to be open year-round uh, based on The Walking Dead. And so today I think what we'd all like to do um, is talk to you a little bit about that attraction, uh, explain some of the differences of what's different about a permanent attraction versus what you might have seen in the past at Halloween Horror Nights. We're not going to give away every detail, because you know, I hate spoilers. <laughs> you watch The Walking Dead, I'm sure you, you, know, you hate spoilers. Usually like when, when things are really busy, I fall behind on the show and I, I have to avoid social media altogether, as I know a lot of you do, because I don't want to know what's happened. Um, also, part of horror, and to scare you guys, is a surprise, right? Mm. And that's what we do, is we set stuff up as you guys walk through specific rooms, if you guys have been to Halloween Horror Nights. Um, and it's a surprise of what happens. So that's a big part of it. You know, um, I know for myself, want to keep as much as we can, of, you know, hidden and as a surprise. And honestly, for there's going to be some stuff in there that you're going to go, how did they do that? And we want to do that. That's the cool part of this too. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about a couple things in particular. We will reveal today a couple of the scenes that we are doing in this attraction. Um, but I thought, as a starting place, it's, it seems like maybe half of you guys have never been to Horror Nights before. 
Um, so real quick, just wanted to revisit you know, our history with The Walking Dead. As I mentioned, Chris and I have been dealing with them since 2012. Actually, um, predating that, um, we actually got approached a uh, long, long time ago before that by AMC about whether or not we would be interested in doing um, you know, Walking Dead for Halloween Horror Nights. And, and the first year, we didn't do it. Um, because the show hadn't debuted yet, I hadn't seen it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I knew about the comic, as a lot of you did, and a lot of you do. Um, but at that point, you know, we kind of had decided our lineup, and we decided, well, you know, let's see how this show does. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started watching the show, and from the minute, from that pilot episode, you know, honestly, as a fan, I was hooked. And, you know, all it took was that opening episode with Rick waking up in the hospital, and, and seeing that little girl, and I was absolutely hooked. I loved the show, I watched it obsessively, I still do, I still watch it as a fan, but I watch it with a, a very different eye. Most people hate watching Walking Dead with me, uh, because I always look, watch the show, and I know you do too. You, you probably, your family probably hates watching it with you. I know my wife hates watching it with me. Uh, because we watch it as designers, we're always looking for that next thing that we can grab. Um, but after we were able to watch the first season of Walking Dead, um, immediately we knew it would be a great fit for Halloween Horror Nights. So we started our relationship in 2012, just brought along a couple of key images. This to me is, is the essence of what we try to do with Horror Nights, you know? It's, um, it's trying to take, whether it's a movie or a TV show, whatever it is, we're trying to recreate it and bring it to life, what we would call movie quality. And maybe Chris, you can talk a little bit about this particular scene. This is from our 2012 maze. Yeah, you know, you can see this thing. Everything that we do is, like John said, trying to bring it to a certain level of quality, just even within Halloween Horror Nights, like a temporary event, you know, uh, 20, 30 days. Um, so um, even within here, just regarding the sets and such, you know, we're not just painting walls, we're troweling walls. We're really trying to give you a good sense and feeling of um, walking right through the show, actually. Um, you know, we're trying to, you know, bring things really to um, a really certain high level. And as you can see here, that, you know, we don't hold back on anything, and even in respect to the gore. You know what I was particularly excited about in this particular scene, when I, I got a chance to walk through it after our prop crew got done? The fact that, you know, his, obviously his, his you know, brains are, are splattered on the wall, but there were little chunks of hair. <laughs> that, you know, I'm sick, I guess. It made me really excited. <laughs> well, also teeth. Our prop guys oh. also add teeth in there, too. And yeah, so she so walked around the prison and found little teeth laying on the ground. Um, 2012, what we focused on was, you know, the beginning of the show, was the hospital. So that meant we had to recreate the hospital. Um, not the easiest environment to recreate. No, it's not, actually. Um, you know, we really try to emulate that look, um, and this is the first year that uh, we worked with AMC, and uh, um, really wanted to get that sense and feeling of, uh, you know, that zombie apocalypse, and um, uh, just that overrun feeling. Um, we did have some uh, walkers up in that one, was it we, or projection? Yeah, shadow uh, projection, which I think was us, if memory yes. serves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which it usually is. Um, when we got to 2013, the show had changed. The major setting for the show was now the prison. So that meant we had to replicate the prisons. Just a couple of images of the maze in 2012. Um, how many times have we built that tower now <laughs> over the years? We did it several times, actually. One time was actually out of Terratram as well, but within the prison, you know, we're, you know, we're in a tent. So um, really was trying to get that feeling of uh, right when you step into uh, cell block D, that you walked into this, you know, huge cell block uh, that had a mezzanine and a second story. So, but we're inside of a tent, so we had to position that cell block in a certain way that we can erect 16-foot walls in there. Um, and then we uh, started off that you walked through actually some really tiny hallways, some really confining hallways. That so when you walked out there and you walked into that cell block, it was like, whoa, that you would have no expectation that we would put something like that inside of a small tent. Um, so that's kind of another surprise and what we try to pull off to scenically. In the image next to it is, is uh, an effector, uh, a gag as we call it, um, that we call the zombie uh, 
hoard card or the walker hoard card. And this is a good example of what you do in a temporary attraction versus what you do in a permanent attraction because uh, this is the true definition of a term we use in the theme park industry called free animation. And what we mean by that is uh, the way we did this gag, you turned a corner and also this horde of walkers come rushing out at you, um, all of which were static figures. And maybe Chris, you can explain real quick how we did this particular effect. Yeah, it's puppet driven. We have a performer behind it. Uh, the performer is actually watching a monitor. And there's a camera on the opposite side. So usually this is a setup where uh, you're passing through a curtain and it's really dark and then he can see you, you can't see him. Um, sometimes we try to associate maybe, you know, a blinder in your eyes. So you, when you step into that darkness, it's a total surprise. But um, it, it's, this is all based on the effect to really scare you is timing. And if that performer is, is really picking that up, really is your part in that curtain, he needs to be ready for that. The specific performers for this were awesome. Awesome the first year so much that we wanted to keep rolling with this type of effect. And really for, you know, when you're a performer in the world of Halloween Horror Nights, and it's, it's not dissimilar from being a performer in this attraction when it opens, um, we always have a saying uh, with Horror Nights in that we say it's a new show every 10 seconds. And that's because you, when you're doing a walkthrough attraction, it's not a ride. It's not like you know where the ride vehicle is and you can choreograph everything precisely around that timing. It's people walking through an experience. So you can never guarantee what pace those people are going to walk at. So what we ask of our performers is that they treat it like every scene is a new show every 10 seconds. Because that's roughly the length of time it takes your average guest to walk through a scene. So when you do the math on that, what that translates to for, say, the guy who was doing this particular effect, pushing this walker horde card back and forth, he would have done that about 40,000 times during the course of one season of Halloween Horror Nights. So he probably had huge muscles by the time he was done. Um, the free animation part of it is there was a hard mechanical stop, so that when he reached the end of this, basically, essentially like a dolly track, like you would for a camera, as this thing rolled out and hit its stop, we noticed that it made the, the static figures on the card kind of wiggle and jiggle and come to life. So when you light that a certain way with strobe lighting, it looked like they were, in fact, moving. Um, but in reality, they were all static figures. And that's really, you know, one of the big differences because, you know, when you do a permanent attraction, you don't have to do things like that. You can't, you know, you don't have to solely rely on a puppeteer moving, you know, a static figure and hoping it's going to jiggle a little bit. You can take it up to the next level. And we'll show you examples of that as we go along. Uh, then we got to 2014 um, and started riffing on Terminus, which was a big theme in, in the show, and it was the journey to Terminus. That particular season, they didn't. They kind of got to Terminus at the very, very end of the season. So uh, for us, the, still the major setting for us was the prison, but the prison had radically changed. Um, by this point in the show, uh, the governor, you remember him, right? The governor rolled up on the prison in that tank, and he crashed through the chain link fence, and that big battle ensued. So we wanted to take the environment that we did the previous year, the prison, but we wanted to change it up and make it look like we were arriving at the prison right after um, the governor attacked. Where did we get the tank, Chris? Do you remember? Because that was a real tank. <laughs> did we steal it? Yeah, yeah from Green's Road. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be the first people. Actually, you know, um, do you guys remember a movie called The Blues Brothers? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. There's this part of the Universal Backlots called the Transportation Department. And they have all kinds of cool vehicles out there. And they, rent, and they use them for like movies and television shows. And I, a couple of years ago, Chris and I were working with John Landis, the director of uh, American Warhol from London. How many of you guys saw our American Warhol from London maze? Yeah. So John, John is a walking encyclopedia about movie history, and particularly the movies he worked on. He, he did so many great classic movies. His Blues Brothers was one of the movies he worked on with Belushi and Aykroyd. And um, at the time, Belushi was staying up in the Hollywood Hills and he figured out that if you went down to the transportation department, they left the keys for all the vehicles sitting on top of the tires. So one night, John went down there and took a World War II military vehicle, like a tank, and drove it up to the Hollywood Hills for a party he was having in the Hollywood Hills. And the next morning, they were shooting some, I think it was for television, they were shooting some big World War II scene. And uh, 
You know, it was like that scene in Stripes where Captain Stillman, you know, walks in and goes, oh, where, where's my truck? You know, uh, they, went to, they went down there and they were like, uh, and then they, they, they kind of knew at this point that it was Belushi because he was kind of famous for doing things like this. So uh, they asked Landis, they're like, could you call Belushi and see if he's got our tank? And sure enough, he, he had it up at, the, at his rental house up in the Hollywood Hills and they had to get him to, somebody to drive the tank back to Universal. Oh, kind of similar like that, uh, Chris and I noticed that we had this really cool tank. It was sitting on a... Did you work on Reed's Road, Don? Yeah, uh, the, I think it was part of our uh, Transformers. Yeah, did it come from... I think it came from the movie Transformers, but it was one of the movie cars that we had on display. And Chris and I kind of were driving around the back line one day on a golf cart and we went, Hey, there's a tank sitting out there. I bet you we could use that. So we got a crane and we lifted the thing and put it on a truck and drove it down there. Um, but it was a real tank. And that's, you know, kind of the cool thing about working in a movie studio. Sometimes you get lucky in the things you need for, you know, for even a temporary attraction. You can steal a tank. When, when you're um, and then uh, lastly, 2015, which was the last year, we finally uh, got to deal with Terminus. Um, this was a really interesting one. And I think it... it it kind of follows the vibe of where the show's been going lately. Um, and it's something we're going to try to do with the permanent attraction, too, because one thing that's become true in Walking Dead in recent years is sometimes the humans are more dangerous than the walkers. Um, and certainly that was the case in Terminus. You know, once they actually got there, you realized, I hope it's not a spoiler, I hope you guys are all caught up, I'm not going to spoil anything if I say what those people in Terminus were doing. They were cannibals. They ate people. So basically, you know, it was all, you know, this horrible setup. It was a trap where they put the signs by the road, you know, go to Terminus, it's safe, it's, you know, community for all, but when you got there, they ate you. Um, what was interesting about this particular maze, and I don't know how many people caught it, is once you got past the facade, there were walkers out in front. You didn't see another walker until about five scenes into the attraction. Because the whole first end of it, we wanted to make you feel like we were hurting you through Terminus. So, um, all of the performers in that scene were all of the people who worked in Terminus, and uh, we got to recreate some of the more gory moments in the show, including um, that, that part where they have them all bent over the trough and they slit the guy's throat. And uh, sometimes, you know, working with actors, you, uh, even though it's a new show every 10 seconds, you can do, you know, something that's purely theatrical, that is, you know, like, like a little teeny mini play, and that scene was true of that where the guy's job was to come out, take his victim. You know, he already had the slit throat prosthetic on his neck already. Um, so he had his head down so that in the lighting, he was casting a shadow on him so he wouldn't see what he had on his neck. And then he mimed like he was cutting his throat. He lifted his head back, that hit the lights. You saw that his throat was slit. And then the performer who was getting his throat slit had a little switch that he could hit, which uh, shot um, compressed air and water on you so that you felt like you were actually getting covered in blood. <laughs> and see. <laughs> so, you know, in, in dealing with this show over the years, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges for all of us working on this attraction was what to focus on for a permanent attraction. So we've been working on this for two years? Two years, years. yeah. Um, so when we all got together and sat down and we knew we were going to be doing a permanent attraction based on Walking Dead, probably the biggest challenge right out of the gate was just trying to decide what to focus on because the show's been on the air for multiple seasons. This, sh this particular attraction doesn't focus on one season or one moment. It embraces the entire series. But as designers, that was a conundrum for us was because no matter what you're creating, you always have a finite amount of space and you have to fit as much as we can in it. And Chris and I took a different tact with this compared to like Horror Nights. You know, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about how we wanted to change it up design-wise as opposed to a typical Horror Nights maze. It's not a typical Horror Nights maze. You've seen some of the facilities we're in, like tents, or you know, we do have a soundstage facility, or, but mostly we um, erect a tent, and that's around 4,000 square feet. But within that space, um, I will use up and pretty much every single inch of it and um, fight for people over any negative space there is actually that I can try to create more intensity, more of a scare, more of the show actually. Um, 
I make tech rooms really small, which really irks off our techs, actually. But they're not here today. I feel they're pain today because I'm one today. So I'm really trying to push for show and trying to give you guys as much uh, you know, as what you can see as you walk through these things. So that's a little bit different. Um, we're, we're really confining you as well. Um, this is more, uh, a little bit bigger and broader sets, but more high-end sets. Um, and really trying to like, which we have said before, put you right within the television show, but you know, at this permanent level, um, really taking the, the level of sets and what we do and all the scenic tricks and taking them up to a higher level, which, and into a permanent, higher level, which is very difficult to do. Stuff has really kind of got to be bulletproof, so to speak. Yeah. You also got to focus on transitions a lot more because, you know, in the world of like a maze for a, a Halloween event, you can kind of radically jump places, you know, just kind of the, you know, the illusion or the magic of, you know, it being, you know, a haunted house. You can, you can turn a corner and all of a sudden you're in a totally different environment or you can go through a a blackout transition where the walls are all just black and it's kind of like it, to us in, in our vocabulary it's kind of like a, a cut point or an edit in the film um, but here we needed to tie it all together so the whole thing breathes a lot more and the transitions are, are a lot more um, like logical nothing is you know if, if you're in, if you're outdoors and you're going to be heading to an indoor location we've got to define all of that you can't just suddenly jump in you're in the middle of the scene um, there's, we're just referencing a couple of, actually four, you know, iconic environments that were featured on the show. Not all of these are in the permanent attraction, and I'm not going to tell you which ones are in and which ones are out. <laughs> Fodder for the internet, how do you like that? <laughs> uh, the, the other great thing about the permanent attraction is Universal is building us a building for this attraction. So, uh, the team has been very careful to, as Chris said, use every single inch. So that uh, everything is out in the show that it can be, but uh, we also have great infrastructure to take care of our artists and our performers, um, and make sure that um, you know when they're offset, they they have a great place to go, relax, and then come back out and uh, make sure they get the best show possible. Um, and it also upgrades, obviously, with all the infrastructure to support the special effects, lighting and so forth because we have a, a totally controlled environment. And, you know, some of you guys, do you guys remember House of Horrors, which was an attraction at Universal prior to this, and it you know, turned out as part of this project? Um, and Chris and I did the, the last iteration of House of Horrors um, years ago, and, and wanted to just explain the difference between, if you've experienced that walkthrough, um, what's radically different about this one. You know, how, how many of you guys know your Universal Hollywood history? Do you remember what House of Horrors was? Like the first thing it was? Before Von Helsing, yes, it was a restaurant. Do you, anybody remember the name of the first restaurant it was? I'll be really impressed if you do. Victoria Station. Victoria Station, very good. It was a Victoria Station restaurant. Um, and then it became um, Marvel Mania, it became a, a Marvel, do you remember the 90s when themed restaurants were really big? I worked on a bunch of them that like, never saw the light of day for all these people um, that I can't say now what they were, but they were, um, we, it was like this crazy period where there was a Barbie restaurant, I mean every, there were restaurants, anything that had a theme became a restaurant, um, but there was this really cool Marvel restaurant there for a long time. Um, and then when that went away, it became a series of, of temporary walkthroughs for the theme park. I believe, was it Chicken Run the first yeah, time? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Chicken, Chicken Run. Run. You remember the animated movie Chicken Run? That was a temporary walkthrough. Uh, there was also, let's see if I can remember it, The Grinch. It was a walkthrough for The Grinch. Van Helsing. The Mummy. Mm -hmm. The Mummy Returns. Von Helsing. And then House of Horrors. So what I'm saying by all of this is it, it was a bunch of different stuff. If you went into that building and went downstairs, you could still find the kitchen. You know, it was still down there. I mean, it, it wasn't a building that was built for a walkthrough attraction. It was something that was kind of, you know, uh, existed as a restaurant and then various things were imposed upon it. Um, and part of the reason we tore it down is we had to start over. We needed a brand new, you know, building a brand new facility. And now we have a state-of-the-art facility that we're going to be building our attraction in. Um, also, when you're talking about what characters to think about. Um, 
Some of these characters you'll see in the interaction and some of them you won't. Um, but as designers for Chris and I, what all of this meant is I think we went through, was it 12 different full iterations of this show? You know, designed 12 different versions and various versions had certain scenes in, certain characters in, certain characters out. Um, but we spent I think, the first year of this project pretty much trying to design, you know, what the show was going to be. Um, and with all these different iterations, and it's always a very painful process because you want something to be in it, and then you realize, well, if I have to, you know, if I have to have this in it, I can't have that in it. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, all of us are huge fans of the show. We watch it obsessively. We hope that the choices, when you get to see it, the choices that we made to include in the attraction are, are some of the fans' favorites as well. Let's talk about Mr. Nicotero. Greg uh, we've had a long, long history with Greg Nicotero. If you don't know Greg, Greg is, uh, started out as the, as the guy who did all of the makeup for The Walking Dead, um, but has since become uh, executive producer on the show and also one of the lead, you know, and also does uh, a lot of the directing of the episodes. If you saw the uh, Valentine's Day episode when they just came back on the air for Valentine's Day, a really intense episode where lots of people died, and I won't tell you who of you haven't caught up. Um, that, Greg directed that episode. He's one of their best directors. Um, we've had a long history with Greg. This is a, if I can make this video work, this is a, a, a quick little clip of Greg from 2012. And of course, I'm not going to have any audio. So let me tell you what Greg's saying. <laughs> Greg is a huge fan of Halloween Horror Nights. Um, when we first met Greg, and I actually met him years ago uh, on a movie called Land of the Dead. Does anyone remember George Romero? Remember Land of the Dead? Uh, I, I met him all those years ago, so when we got to, uh, to meet Greg with Walking Dead, he was thrilled about the idea of Walking Dead being part of Halloween Horror Nights. And so every year, every single sculpt, every single you know, makeup walker we created, Greg would look at and personally improve himself. Um, but what we haven't had with Greg, and we do now, is him being personally involved. So about, let's see, two, three, no, two, three months ago, I think we were at an offsite, like a corporate offsite, and I got a message from Greg, and, and the message was, I really, really, really want to be like involved in this attraction, like more involved than I've ever been before. And so we all met with Greg and got together, and what that's led to is that Greg and his company, k and are actually creating all of the uh, animatronic walkers for this attraction because we have a fair amount of, of animatronics in this attraction, so every single character that's an animatronic, Greg's actually doing the, the, the skins and the, uh, what we would call the cores in the industry for animatronics. So all of those are coming directly off the molds that he used to create the characters in The Walking Dead. I don't know if Chris or Don, you have anything to add to that? That's pretty cool right there, what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it takes us to a whole new quality level. Uh, because normally we'd be creating those things and trying to replicate, but now we have the master himself who is giving us his molds, and um, it just takes it to a higher level. Whole higher level. Yeah, on, on screen walkers, essentially, that's what you'll see in the attraction, essentially. So let's uh, let's reveal one right now. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna tell you a couple of things um, that you're gonna experience in the attraction. So we, we will give away a couple of spoilers, and you know some of these are gonna be obvious because if you know The Walking Dead, I mean, you gotta have this, right? Everybody know what this is? Um, the Dead Inside Doors. This is actually from our maze. This, these are pictures from our maze in 2012 when Chris and I created this scene the very, very first year we worked on Walking Dead. Um, and I thought what might be interesting is explain the difference between how we did this back in 2012 for Halloween Horror Nights and how we're doing it now. So if you're a guest, you walked into the hospital in the maze, you walked towards this, you saw the hands, they were already out, and I think I have, I think I have Chris's elevation in here. Yeah. So, would you mind describing how we did this for Halloween Hornets? The door was dark, essentially, so try not to pick up that. You can see the hands that were already uh, within the door. Um, on the other side, we had a performer, so it was puppet-driven. Um, 
it's difficult for us on a temporary basis to make something mechanical. Um, you know, within Universal, there's a lot of rules and regulations in respect to mechanical equipment and being close to guests and such. And you're this, really close to this. Yeah, you walk. You could walk right up to it. We really tried to um, bring this scene exactly how it was from the show, how, exactly how Rick saw it. We really studied all this and really, really tried to bring it back. But there was a safety aspect to this, um, which on both of the double doors, we had foam integrated at the first, uh, like say, two inches on each side of the door. So if a guest came up and did stick their hand through as the door was closing, as the performer's pulling it closed, essentially it was just foam that would, you know, essentially wrap around his hands. It'd be safe. And that's how we built that. Um, so it was very safe for the guests, and that we felt comfortable, as well as our environmental health and safety department felt comfortable with this as well. And that we could play this and um, have guests come up and really get scared. So really it was a, hey, check it out, and then we had a scare, so it was really a distraction. So there's a guy behind the door too, and he's looking at a monitor, and he sees you on camera, and he sees when you're getting close, he's able to step on what's basically a guitar pedal foot switch, and that triggers his own audio cue of the walkers going, <laughs> and the door slamming back and forth, which was yeah. me, actually, I was the walkers, so I could do that. Um, and he was mechanically, you know, doing it himself. He was making the door shake back and forth. That's not how we're doing it for the permanent attraction. Uh, this is a couple of pieces of key art that uh, we recently released as part of the uh, launch of the attraction. Um, this is a really uh, a different thing that we decided to do with this particular attraction, and I think a really cool decision, because like I said, we did 12 different iterations of the show. So originally this scene was in a different part of the attraction. And then we started thinking about it, and we thought, we want people, the minute they walk into this building, to feel like they're in the world of The Walking Dead. And if you're gonna start anywhere in The Walking Dead, you gotta start with the hospital, because that's where it all began, and that's the pilot episode. So the beginning of the attraction is the hospital, and when you walk through the emergency room doors and you're inside the hospital, from the minute you walk in, it's heavily, heavily themed. It looks exactly like it looked when Rick woke up and started walking through. So, uh, we decided to put this in the queue line. So as you're going through the queue line, you're going to encounter this. This is tripped by a sensor. These are animatronics. There are multiple sets of hands. They do different things. But basically, the figures come through the doors. Um, they have, uh, the hero hands have full range of movement. Um, they can be programmed multiple ways. So we can, do, we can stagger them and do them differently. So if you come back, you might see a sequence that's slightly different than the sequence that you see the first time. But um, we know this is going to be an Instagram moment. We know everybody's going to want to take a picture of it. So we actually included this in the queue line of the attraction. So as you're going through the queue line, one of the things you're going to experience before you even walk through the, you know, the actual attraction part of the experience is the dead inside doors. Let's reveal another one. Um, you guys remember this episode? It was called Still? Okay. The Burning Cabin. Something we could never do in a million years in Halloween Horror Nights. But we're going to do it for this attraction. Um, we're going to do a cabin that's on fire. You're going to feel the heat. You're going to smell the sense. It's going to be a full sensory experience. But to do it, um, we're using a technology uh, called faux fire. So it's not real fire. It's made by a company called TechFX. Um, I think I have a little short clip, and thankfully this clip doesn't have audio anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but this is in their shop. This is what it looks like. Um, it's essentially steam and lighting. You can put your hand right in the middle of it and it won't hurt you. Um, but in the right conditions, um, and actually air is a huge thing. Uh, just the air handling alone, Don, I know the HVAC side of this was a nightmare because air radically affects the way this, this effect works. So you have to be very careful about where you place air handlers or, or even the air you're sucking out of the room. There's a massive boiler that we have to have just to have this effect. Actually, three boilers working simultaneously to put this much steam into the apparatus. And um, when you come up on the set, it will look like it's on fire. We have a, a walker character, the burned walker character, of course, that's going to come out of this house. Um, he's going to be smoking. He's going to be smoldering. It's an effect we're r and right now, so that it looks like he's still on fire. Um, and uh, 
I think when we combine all those elements, you know, the heat, the, the smoke, the scent, all of these things, um, it should make for a great experience. Um, let's talk real quick about the, the looks of the walker. So this is a walker called um, Hospital Walker, I believe. Um, we had to R&D a whole new way of doing walkers, different from how we do uh, park walkers. Sorry. Thank you. Um, we had to R&D a whole new way of doing walkers, different from how we do them in Halloween Horror Nights. And, and different how we did it in House of Horrors, like we had talked about House of Horrors before. And, you know, we designed and kind of ran that facility in respect to like any of the costumes and makeup and such. So, we, what, what, so real brief, is some of the challenges that we've always experienced in House of Horrors and some of the other attractions that we discussed before that, get the mummy and that, um, we wanted to actually, you know, fix some of those issues and problems within this attraction, actually, um, and try to bring, not try, but actually bring the level of the quality right up to um, the show standards. So these are the sculpts that our, our makeup artists did um, to create this particular character. And the, the big difference, this is the character on the show that we're trying to recreate. Um, what we wanted to do that we don't do at Horror Nights um, was we wanted to get those dead eyes. Um, and there's, of course, you can do that with context. There's lots of ways of doing it. Um, we also wanted to get the mouth movement, which you could do with prosthetic makeup. But when you think about it, if you're an actor working in a permanent attraction, that's 365 days a year of spirit hell. Your face would look like hell after about two weeks of that. So we needed to come up with a different system. So real quick, uh, this is some R&D video footage that we shot. Um, I'm going to narrate over part of it. Um, this is a high-end silicone mask. Uh, actually, I think the next shot is going to be me wearing it, because Chris and I, we always try these things on. Um, the eyes are actually built into the mask. The, the mask has an internal structure, so if John puts it on, it looks the same. If I put it on, and I have That's a different shape of film face, footage of him in action. Yeah, and it'll look the same. If Don puts it on, it will still look the same. And that's what we're really trying to do, is really get that specific look and keep that look that no matter what performer wore it. Um, and our big thing was trying to get some mouth movement. So within the structure, we have essentially a hinge point that can help with this fighting action, which that's how walkers attack. So that's really one of this snapping, kind of biting look to. So underneath that whole thing, there's uh, they're wearing like a black ninja hood too, so you don't see anything when they open their mouth. Um, but it's going to give them the ability to have the dead eyes and look like a walker on the show, but also to give them the ability uh, of biting, because that's such an important part of the show. And they become a lot more threatening. Speaking of walkers, Don, we have an announcement about auditions. We do. We do. Uh, so, uh, part of our infrastructure, of course, is that we're running an attraction, so we have an enormous amount of artists that we need to hire. Uh, so, we're announcing today that auditions are going to be on May 5th to the 6th. Um, you can see the website up there if anybody here is interested or one, wants to convey that to somebody else. And um, these performers will be part of uh, our ACBA agreement, which is uh, American Variety Artist. And um, we're really excited. Um, it is a huge cast, and the infrastructure backstage to hold that cast of rotating uh, numerous casts at the same time. On a peak day, there will be three to four casts rotating at any given time through the building um, to ensure that guests don't wait too long, everybody gets in, gets a quality experience. So if you know somebody uh, that is just dying to be a walker or a survivor, uh, um, this is the place to come and, and strike, strike your talent. And if you ever wanted to work uh, in a theme park as an actor, in any case, it's ushauditions.com is the website, and then, or you can follow them at, at ushauditions. Um, real quick, I know we're running short on time, but we are going to do a trivia question, and we are going to give away some frontline passes so you can come see this thing. So, real quick, about five minutes, Q&A. Anybody got any questions we can answer right down here in front? to thank all of you for coming and sharing your 
expertise and your experience. You've talked about working with Greg Nicotero. Some of the other things that you've done at Universal Studios through your careers, if you could talk about the collaborative process and how amazingly easy it is to have Greg with you to get the vision right. Have you had that before in any of your other collaborations and could you talk about that? Yeah, that's something that we always uh, strive for. We always want to work with the creative individuals. You know, last year it was Guillermo del Toro and Crimson Peak working directly with Guillermo. Um, you know, Landis on American World from London and many, many, many people over if, the years. If, if we are working with them and like Greg, which which he's got this effects company and he has the molds to all this stuff and he's the ultimate sign off approver for all this aesthetic locker stuff. You know, it being integrated and we're side by side with him, it's just we're gonna win. You know, well, um, Alien versus the Predator open. too. I mean, if you saw that maze in the Queen Alien, that was right off the molds from the film. Sure, so that's awesome. always an yep. ideal. In the back there. This is with maybe that kitchen could be used for Carol and her cookies. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. She could make those more of her cookies. So I'm going to have a chance. There you go. I'll get right down here. Um, how long is the experience going to be? And can you tell us when the attraction is actually going to open? No, I can't. <laughs> um, summer. <laughs> it's going to open in the summer, and, and it's because there's a very specific rollout that we, you know, I have to adhere to that. Um, it's, it's hard to estimate, honestly, like how long in time it's going to be because I have seen people, well, I have seen people sprint through these attractions. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Last year I was going I was going through a Halloween maze or Michael Myers maze and uh, I was walking right behind a group um, and they were the front of the group you know they were the pulse right in front and they were booking it and I was just sitting there going Jesus Christ slow down look at all this stuff we built you know uh, so you know five minutes is kind of like it, it really depends I mean like I put a clock to our, our Walking Dead maze last year. Uh, which was the biggest one we ever did, and this one's bigger than that. But it was like five minutes, so probably a little bit more than that. I would maybe seven at the top end. But walkthroughs, people kind of do them at their own pace. Yep, right down here in front. Um, it's safe to say it's going to be open for Halloween Horror Nights this year. Yes, it will be open for Halloween Horror Nights this year, and next year, and the year after. That. Next question right over there. Sir, yes. Uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, yeah. the premiere had the cast members show up. Uh, I, I don't, I can't speak to like definitely who's going to show up, but I do know having done Horror Nights for multiple years, and we, we often hosted their, their television premiere, um, we'll see them for sure. I mean, I've seen over the years gotten to you know, go through the maze with so many cast members of Walking Dead, and, and they all you know, love it, love it, love it to death. And, and something I just would say about the cast in general, they're the coolest people. I mean, watching them with their fans, it's super impressive how much time you know, and effort they give to you know, making sure every one of the fans that they be, you know, get, get a good experience. They're really impressive that way, and I fully expect to see them come down. You, sir, right in the back. Oh, good, good question. Content-wise? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. No. <laughs> and, and, and really, that's a big, big deal. I mean, it really is, because honestly, and really honestly, you just don't see stuff like this in a theme park. You just don't anymore. I, I can't, I was trying to think, can you think of a theme park that has a year-round walk-through haunted house um, that's done like as a Halloween event in terms of intensity? I honestly can't. Maybe back east, but I can't. And, and actually, this is more intense than Halloween work. Yeah, really I mean, we're, we're really surprised that we're allowed to do something. <laughs> we had a lot of conversations about this, and you know, the first thing I said when, when we all started talking about doing Walking Dead, I said, we cannot do Walking Dead light. We can't. No. And um, to the credit of our, of our uh, park president and everybody associated with our park, they didn't want us to. So it's, it's going to be more about communicating the age appropriateness of the attraction before you go in, and that's the big thing that we're all working on. Um, because that's a, because if you go through, um, you're going to get, as Don said, an even more intense experience than Halloween Horror Nights. That little film clip we showed, we just did a big film shoot, 
it's gnarly. You know, there was a lot of blood. Um, so it's going to be intense. Okay, how about one more question, then I'm going to ask you guys a question, and then we're going to give away some tickets. All the way in the back. Yes, ma'am. Um, even with Horror Nights, we always recommend 13 and under not shouldn't go through it. I've seen babies. I've seen parents literally carrying newborn, like out of the one newborn children, you know, coming back. That, that would have been me. Um, yeah, I was with my daughter Sam. She was like six days old. But I got to be honest with you, my wife had to experience the event, and so did my daughter. But I didn't take my daughter. I don't mean last <laughs> But it was during the day, and the lights were on, and I covered up all the dead bodies. And, and she hugged Michael Myers and said she loved him. So. But, yeah, let's let's uh, let's move on to our trivia question. Okay. I'm hoping you guys are fans of Halloween Horror. I mean, sorry, Walking Dead. Because I'm going to ask a really tough trivia question. And um, I just want you to raise your hands, don't shout it out, or you know, we're going to pack up our computer and leave and give away nothing. Okay? Um, raise your hands. I'm going to go by just the first person I see that raises their hands. Okay, here's the question. And you're going to win two uh, front line tickets to come to Universe Studios Hollywood and experience um, the Walking Dead attraction and everything else we have to offer. As you know, we have a lot of stuff opening up this summer. Okay. Oh, before I do that, <laughs> Easter eggs. Um, being big fans of the show, uh, if you're a fan of Walking Dead, we have littered this attraction with Easter eggs. They're everywhere. So it's going to be a fun thing to see if you guys can find them all, because every single thing in this attraction relates back to the show, whether it's a name on a door or you, you name it. Um, so with that in mind, trivia giveaway. You will win two frontline tickets to Universe Studios Hollywood, and here we go. Before 1847, what was the town of Atlanta, Georgia originally called? The guy right over there in the black shirt. Terminus. Right there. Terminus. Terminus. You are absolutely Woo! right. Wow. All right. Thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind handing that gentleman. And then, uh, if you want to come up, we'll tell you how to redeem that. Um, thank you guys so much for coming here today. We really appreciate it. I know another panel has to come in here, so we're going to call it. Uh, there'll be more information coming out. Thanks for joining us.